Uh, verse 29, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. Amen. And to whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. This is the work of God. You've been hearing this for months now. <laughs> so, let's go to Romans chapter number 3. And we're going to look in verse number 9. And so, this is what... This is why we, as human beings, need to be justified. Amen. Romans 3, at the very beginning, is giving us a courtroom setting. God the Father is sitting on the throne as judge. Uh, the Apostle Paul is the prosecuting attorney, bringing the charges from the law of God. And there stands Jesus, the mediator and advocate with those that believe, petitioning our case. But Paul gives us a very bleak outlook, and this is why we need to evangelize. This is why we need to support missionaries. This is why we need to do all that we can while we can, because it affects every human being on the face of the earth. So Romans chapter 3, verse 9. He spends the first eight verses talking about Jews and it, uh, they have any advantage. And Paul says, yeah, because they've gotten the oracles of God. But he sa And then he comes on and, and says some things there. But mainly he gets to the whole force of the matter in verse 9. When he says, what then? Are we better than they? Now, that, that, that's something we need to underline and underscore. There's a lot of people think they're saved because they had something in them that somebody else didn't have. No. No. When God looked, at, God looked on humanity, He didn't see none being good. He's fixing to tell us that. He's seen us all the same. What then are we better than they? No, in no wise. So let's just stop right there. Nobody in this room is better than anybody else in this room tonight. Amen. There's nobody out yonder better than anybody else in all the world. It's all level ground. It's all level ground, folks. Whether you've been saved 50 years or 5 days, it's all level ground. He says, for we have before proved. Now, Paul's saying this ain't nothing new. I've proved this before. There's nothing new under the sun, okay? Amen. This is what he says. He says, y'all already know this. For we have before proved that both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Alright? So Jew. Who's a Jew? Those are, are of Israel. Those that live in Israel. They are Jewish people. Gentiles are as everybody else that is not a Jew. Amen. So, even God's elect in the Old Testament, Israel, and everybody else were all under sin. Now, this matter of being under sin, under sin is very important for us to understand. There's nobody free tonight. There's nobody free tonight. Everybody in this room has a master. You're either a master of the devil and sin, or you're a master, your master is Jesus and righteousness. So I need proof of that. Look at Romans chapter 6. Verse 17. I love it. I love it. Verse Romans 6, we're going to read verse 15. What then? 
well, well, let, let's, let's, we've got to do some prior reading to understand this. Uh, verse 12, Romans 6, 12. And we're ultimately going to get down to about verse 17. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are, watch this, alive from the dead. So he's talking to saved people. He, he says, you, you submit yourself to God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, talking about the members of your body, as instruments of righteousness unto God. L look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. You're not under the law, but you're under grace. Amen. Now this doesn't mean I, I've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness and go live any kind of way I want to. The grace of God teaches me not to sin. Amen. I don't want to, but when I do, it tears me up. Yeah. That's the difference because I know how much it cost Jesus on the cross. Verse 15, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? And Paul says, God forbid. Watch verse 16. Know ye not. He says, you need to, y'all supposed to know this is pretty much what he's saying. That to whom, whom ye you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants are ye to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But look at verse 17. It gets real good. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Look at verse 18. Being then made free from sin... Ye became the servants, which is the Greek word doulos, which means slaves of righteousness. Amen. God freed me from sin, and now I'm a slave to righteousness. Yeah. You remember when Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount? He said no man can serve two masters, indicating that everybody has at least one master. Amen. None of us lives to ourselves and do whatever we want to without any repercussions whatsoever. We have to answer to somebody. Yeah. So let that, let that settle in a little bit. Marinate a while. But we're all under sin. So what? According to Romans 6, prior to our conversion... We were under sin. We were bound by sin. We were slaves of sin. And if we were slaves of sin, we couldn't help ourselves but to sin. Is that not right? And so, what, we, what we've got to pay close attention to is that mankind in his fallen state and sin He's governed and directed by his own depravity, his own sin. Our wills, our will to choose, our will to do what, make choices on a regular basis, we choose by the strongest force that we have. If we have, if we're unsaved, sin's going to be that dominating force. Yeah. We're going to choose sin 100% of the time. And we're going to hate the things God loves and we're going to love the things God hates. That's where humanity is right now. Been there. They're found by sin. That's why they can't get it. That's why they can't understand. That man in the garden, when, when we use the word total depravity, it's not immense. It's not meaning what some would have you to believe. And say, well, it can't be total depravity because we're not as bad as we could be. That's never what total depravity means. That's a misrepresentation of it. Total depravity means our minds, our affections, and our wills have been contaminated with sin. Amen. And we are controlled by sin. If you don't believe it, look at your life prior to Jesus saving you. Amen. Yeah, we chose sin. Right? What was the determination?
determining factor. What happened to cause you to want to change? It's, it's a four-letter word. Grace. Oh, it's five-letter word. I'm sorry. <laughs> five-letter word. You forgive me. It's been a long day. Grace. Say, well, our pastor can't count. Pray for me. Grace. Grace. Now, let me just say something. If God does not initiate this, if God does not interrupt your life, and if God just leaves you alone... You're going to stay bound by sin. For a slave to get set free, he has to be bought by another. He accomplished that on the cross. But in time, by the grace of God, he came to you. And brought you out of that grave where you were. Now, look at verse number 10. As it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. None. None has what God requires to get into heaven, which is righteousness. None none of us are righteous in and of ourselves. And look how he begins to deal with how bad we are. In verse number 12, verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 11. There is none that understandeth. I don't know about you, none means none. No, nobody understands. Do you find yourself giving the gospel to some people and they looking at you like a calf looking at a new gate like they don't have any idea what you're talking about? This is all of humanity. By the way, just reminisce, you used to look the same way before grace came to you. We were unbothered by it. Man, get out of here. Nobody won't got time for that Jesus mess. They don't understand. Their greatest need is before them. He just said, and there's none better than none. We're all understand. They're none righteous, no, not one. And he says, on top of us being unrighteous, uh, being unrighteous, nobody understands. So what do you mean? So if some person is beginning to understand, it's because God's at work. Yeah, this is the key, folks. This helps take all the pressure off you. So many folks think, if I witness or I say, I got to say everything just right, I got to do all the... You just be faithful to tell them the gospel. Give the word. God gives the increase, folks. Yeah, amen. God does the saving. Quit making you think I've got to I've got to do it. All I've got to do is proclaim it. God does the rest. When you realize that, you'll say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now, look a bit further. There's none that understand it. And here's what amazes me. He says, There's none that seeketh after God. None. So, well, what if somebody's looking for Jesus? Don't you think it's God drawing them to Jesus? Has to be. You know what he's teaching us? Man can't save himself. Well, somebody just don't wake up one day and say, well, I think I'll go to church and get saved today. Nobody does that. They say it, but biblically, they're not getting it. They, they don't understand. Yeah. There's none that's seeking after God. Now let me just say this. There's many people seeking after fire insurance. There's a lot of people seeking blessings. They're looking for gifts instead of the giver. They want the security, not the Savior. And those become false converts. They become tares among the wheat. So, well, now that I got saved, I felt like I was dying and going to hell. But I wanted Jesus. You, you hear me? Don't, don't let this mess you up. All I'm saying you, when you, you knew you needed Jesus. I'm not trying to confuse nobody. I'm just trying to be biblical here tonight. 
There's people that wants what God has to offer without wanting God. Big difference. A lot of people say, yeah, I'm saved, but they don't go to church. They don't witness. They don't read their Bible. They don't pray. They don't fellowship with other believers whatsoever. They One time I made a decision, and there's that. Is that really seeking after God? No, no. What God started in 2006 for me He's been continuing ever since then. Amen. It's only gotten greater and stronger that I've wanted more. I, I, I refuse to just stay idle. I've got to have more of Him than I, today than I had of Him yesterday. You, you see the idea? I want God. And if He doesn't give me the things, I'm okay because I've got Him. That's the difference between somebody that's real and somebody that's fake. When God takes everything that He gave you and you still have God, you can be like Job and praise Him when you're sitting in the rubble of what's left. You came in this world naked, you're going to leave naked. You're not, nobody took a U-Haul with them to heaven. I've never seen a U-Haul behind a funeral procession. But I did hear a man say he wanted his... Uh, $2.5 million buried with him and the wife was smart. She wrote a check and put it in the coffin. <laughs> yeah. She kept the money, just gave him the check. Yeah. He ain't going to cash it. He ain't going to need it. You get the idea though. Verse 12 says they are all gone out of the way. It means they've gone their own way. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is death. If there was one verse that describes America right now, it's that verse. They've all gone out of the way. They, they're doing their own thing. They're, they're promoting their own agendas. You, you understand something that, it's not a political party. It's called depravity. It's called being lost. It's called being condemned under the condemnation of God because they do not believe on the only name of the Son of God. And Jesus did say that they that believe not the wrath of God abideth continually on them. That's where they are. And he says, and they are all together become unprofitable. And that means Useless and worthless. It's what the old timer says that they're not even worth their salt. Because you got paid in salt in those days. Mm. You mean to tell me I was this bad? Oh yeah. You still are without Jesus. That's right. Amen. You don't believe it, just get yourself out of church, quit reading your Bible if you can. I wouldn't advise it. I wouldn't advise it. It'll come back. Quick. And strong. Yeah, and it'd be worse than what it was. And are become unprofitable. And notice this next part. And there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Nobody's doing good. We'll say, well, well, there's a lot of good. There's no good people in the world. Right. You're not a good person. I'm not a good person. Are we going to believe the Bible tonight? I'm not good. I'm rotten to the core without Jesus. Amen. Who I am today is because of Him. And anybody that's doing any kind of good, it's because of Him. Amen. I'm a wretch. I'm a miserable slave to sin without Jesus. Amen. And apart from His grace, I wouldn't be here tonight doing what I'm doing. We need to understand that. See, 
This is what people don't understand. When they we get talking about the depravity of why people need to be saved, number one, they don't realize how holy God is. And number two, they don't realize how unholy they are. Amen. Well, I don't lie, cheat, and steal, or kill, or I don't commit murder, or, I, you know, I'm not no adulterer. Well, you might want to read Matthew 5 before you make those claims. Right. You angry at your brother without a cause, you're a murderer, according to Jesus. If you lust at the opposite sex in your heart, you're an adulterer tonight. That's what Jesus says. Well, I didn't commit the act. Well, Jesus says you did if you look at him and want it. Right. Hello? If I get angry at somebody just for something just silly and foolish, when I get angry at them and I have no right or reason to be angry at them, I'm a murderer tonight in the eyes of Jesus. That's why he says, Be ye angry and sin not. Oh, well, we have reason to talk then. Yeah, we've got a lot of things to discuss. That's why he says, There's none that doeth good. Now, now in ver from verse 13. Through 18, he starts with the top of the head and goes to the sole of the foot. Amen. Letting us know how messed up we really are. Listen to what he says in uh, verse number 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Y'all know what a sepulcher is? It's a grave. Their throat is an open grave. What comes out stinks. It's unpleasant. And nobody wants to hear it or smell it or anything to do with it. You get the idea. Profane, vile, wretched. With their tongues, they use deceit, which is deception. Oh yeah, we're seeing a lot of that, don't we? Right? And the poison of their asp is under their lips. You know what he's talking about? He's talking of a venomous snake. How they have those uh, glands in there that produce that venom that goes into those fights. He says they're like that. They're like vipers. They open their mouth. It's a stench. It's unpleasant. And they're out to bite somebody and devour somebody. Verse 14, Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Mm -hmm. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is the real reason we have the headlines of today's news today. They fit the bill. They fit the category. And what's even amazing that these same kind of scandals are happening more and more in our churches. Seems like every day there's a new scandal of some man on a mission board or some pastor caught up in 40 year scandal that's been covered up of sexual and physical abuse as they just turned the other way. Got them a Christian lawyer and shipped them out of the states and put them on a mission field working with young people and done been accused of sexually assaulting kids. Got them out of here where they can't be touched to keep on doing it. Hello? Right, yeah, that's right. That's it. The privacy affects everybody. Everybody that's in the church ain't right, folks. Everybody that's up here ain't right. Everybody that's walking around saying, yes, I, I believe Jesus and all, they don't have the goods because this is what's characterized their life. Amen. They're lost. Say, so, well, we, we, it's not our place to say that. Well, friend, when you see this, they don't have any peace. They don't have uh, their destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have, and no fear of God. Hello? You, you see it. But more importantly than us seeing all this around us, this causes us to look at our own selves. That's the whole point of this whole, what I'm doing tonight. We need to look in the mirror. We need a reality check. So, I get a reality check quite often, by the way. You need one. We need one. Look in verse 19. Now we know... 
Whatsoever things the law saith, it saith of them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. Now, this is what we need to understand. We have seen in these verses 8, well, verse 9, down through 18, we've seen the case of the lost. This is every lost man standing. This is their case. Paul has given them an opening door case. They're guilty. Everybody's guilty. Everybody's in need of grace. Everybody needs to be saved. Amen. And then verse 19. We find the place of the law. The law is necessary. If there is no law, people will not know they're sinners. And they will not see their need for Christ. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now, how does all this tie into evangelism? I'm glad you asked. This is what Jesus done when He dealt with people. Y'all remember when the rich young ruler come to Jesus and said, Hey, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' first words were, Why call me good when there's none good but God? So he didn't recognize Jesus as God, and so Jesus is playing along with him. Why are you calling me good? You just see me as a prophet. Why are you calling me good? Because there's none good but God. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus took him to the Ten Commandments and gave him three commandments. Honor thy father, mother, and gave him two more. I can't think off the top of my head. But nonetheless, he says, I've kept them from my youth. Now Jesus just told him there's none good but God. And when he, Jesus said these are the commandments you need to do. And he says, oh yeah, I'm good too, Jesus. He said, well, i tell you what you do. you you're, you got all these goods. Go sell everything you have. Give to the poor and take up your cross and follow me. And the young man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Yeah, yeah. That's what your book says. That's what the Bible tells us. So if Jesus used this tactic... As his model of soul winning, this is what we need to do. We need to be giving people the law. They've heard God loves them and has a plan for their life so many times it doesn't matter anymore. But that, the good news ain't so good until you hear the bad news. And when you hear the bad news, it makes the good news great good news. I need more than somebody tell me God loves me and got a plan for my life. I need to know I'm guilty before God. I need to realize I have a need. And that's exactly what the law does. And the first thing the law does was to shut their lips. That's what it says in verse number 19. Because man's always got to have the last say. He's always got a word. He's always got an excuse, doesn't he? And this is what he says. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. He said the law is going to shut them up. They're walking around bragging about who they are and what they are and what they possess and all that. When you put the law down, they're going to get quiet. Now, look at verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight... Watch this. For by the law is the what? Knowledge of sin. Now, the knowledge of sin not only shuts their lips, but it shows their lostness. People need to get lost. We can't find lost people. You know why? Because we quit teaching the law. So let's take a test tonight. Let's go through the Ten Commandments. And if any time in your life, now I'm I'm talking about ever since you come out of your mother's womb, if you have committed this, you just acknowledge it in your own heart. And then I don't need to know whether you pass or fail because everybody's going to fail tonight. But I'm doing this to help you so when you encounter those people on the job, they can't argue with this book. They can argue with me. They can't argue with the evidence. 
And those times, they believe the Bible and they'll believe the laws. Okay, so let's go. Very first commandment. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. I don't do that. I worship Jesus. Okay? Have you put anything or anyone, including yourself, before Jesus at any time in your life? Yes or no? Yes. And if you say no, you're a liar. Or anything. Yeah. We love ourselves more than we love anybody else. Oh, yeah. I got to have me time. Oh, you better watch yourself. Well, let's go through another question. Another commandment. Thou shalt not worship any graven image. Have you loved a picture of Jesus before in your life? Have you worshipped a ball player and had his poster on your wall? Uh Uh-oh. I'm meddling. You get the idea. You're mesmerized with that celebrity. You got to watch everything they come out with. You, you're worshiping a graven image. Thou shalt not take the name, God's name in vain. That means more than giving God a last name, by the way. If you text and use shorthand and you put OMG, you've just taken God's name in vain. If you said God and D-O-G after that, you've just taken God's name in vain. Or if you use God's name in just a loose manner without any kind of... You've just taken the name of the Lord in vain. Yeah. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Well, we're not under the Sabbath anymore. We worship on the first day of the week. But the rest still applies that there's a day of rest for the people of God. And it says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You keep the Sabbath day, the first day of the week for us. Do you remember that day and keep it holy? Or is it just another day of recreation? Another day to play ball. Another day to go to the lake. Another day to go to the mall. Remember it and keep it holy. Honor thy father and mother. Have any time in your life have you dishonored your parents? Oh God. How awful we have been. Thou shalt not kill. I hadn't killed. Well, Matthew 5 says, If we are angry at our brother without a cause, we just committed murder. We don't like this because we see how bad we really are tonight. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Matthew 5 says, If I look at a woman and I lust over her, I've committed adultery in my heart. That's right. hmm. Thou shalt not steal. Have you taken anything that wasn't yours without asking? Ooh, uh, look at this. Somebody lost this. It belongs to somebody. It's not yours. (laughs) Mm. Thou shalt not bear false witness. It means you're not to tell something that ain't so. That includes white lies. If the crappie was this big, don't say it was this big. If the buck deer was this big, don't say it was this big. And ladies, if it was on sale, don't round it down even lower than what it really was. (laughs) Because you just bore false witness. I don't like this, Pastor. You're making me feel bad good. Because there's good news. Thou shalt not covet. Have you wanted something somebody else possessed that belonged to them? 
You didn't want one like it, but you wanted that one. That's covetous. How did you do? Now, believe it or not, y'all honest because you save people. Okay? So, when we're dealing with lost people, they don't like to admit this stuff. And they'll, they'll think about it and they'll say, well, maybe. And they'll say, well, maybe three of the ten I'm really guilty of. You're ten out of ten all the way. And if there was any other doubt, there might have been eleven out of ten, if that's even a possibility. Okay, yeah. And if you broke one, you broke them all. And that's exactly what James 2 and 10 says. Listen to what it says. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. You can live your whole life. If this, this ain't even a possibility. You, if it was possible to live your whole life and then just one time in your life, five seconds mess up, you just broke the law and you're just as guilty as a man on death row for committing mass murder. You're in the same category as Adolf Hitler. It's the law, not the laws. Right, law. This law. This is the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Jesus summed it up in two. Love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The first, first four commandments is God. The last six is man. So our love relationship's got to be right this way before it'll be right this way. Now what's the good news, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to read it and we're going to go home. you got to come back next week. We'll give you one more. One more. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. But verse 24 is what I want to read. But being justified freely, thank God, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Glory to God. God is just and he is the justifier. Amen. Thank you, Lord. What's that mean? God saves old sinners. Amen. If you're a sinner tonight, you qualify. <laughs> Woo! Look at verse 28. We're going to dismiss. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You know what that means? If you'll come and believe and give yourself to Jesus, saved. Saved. Justified. Yeah. <laughs> Can't explain it. I don't have to. I just believe it. Yeah, yeah, man. That's it. Until you've experienced it, you don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. But if you feel a tug <laughs> and you start to see yourself as you really are, yeah. that's yeah. But if you say, oh, I don't need that stuff to go out, you have every ounce to work. Amen. Every ounce to work. What about you? But I'm glad I learned the bad news. Yeah. Because this makes the good news even greater. You wonder why I'm happy? You know why I sing? I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know it watches over me. Folks, this is what it's all about. And lost people need to hear this. And we need to be the mouth, the spokespeople, telling them, look at what the Bible says.